You're listening to the Paranormal Peeps on the Dark Cast Network. Come to the dark side of indie podcasts with the Dark Cast Network. We have cookies. Between the realm of the dead and the journeys of the living, join Josh, Jamie, and Elisa as they delve into the vast world of the paranormal and breathe life back into the history of the departed. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Paranormal Peeps podcast, and we are excited to have you guys back with us. Yes, welcome. Welcome back, everybody. And we are on episode two of telling our ghost stories from other people's experiences and kind of an add-on of what we have just already previously read. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. There's so many good stories out there of people's encounters and or you know stories that they've heard from a close friend or family member of their experience so yeah they're just they're fun we could we could probably do an entire season on these types of stories oh Oh, we totally could easily i love hearing ghost stories and i think that is what draws us into the paranormal is all these experiences that people have and we're always so excited because People ask us all the time once they find out that you're in ghost hunting, what's your ex- what's the craziest experience you've ever had? Oh yeah, that's always the number one uh-huh. yeah. number one question. Yeah. But I will say this. I remember there were several times we were sitting around campfires or just hanging out, having a few beers and telling these sto- people were telling these stories and they didn't get me excited about the paranormal. They scared the snot out of me. Yeah, but Because you're that... weak. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're the weak link. <laughs> um, that's just because you just didn't have a, a good enough understanding of it. No, no. I was that, that was, you know, prior Josh's life of investigating. Mm-hmm. So before we get on to telling uh, the round two of these ghost stories, we do have an event coming up this October, Friday the 13th. Yeah, what a better day, guys. We had the Benson Griffiths Mill ghost yeah. hunt. Public investigation, y'all. And it's going to be probably unlike most other people's public investigations, we allow more of a free-for-all environment. So you guys get to go out, get to investigate on your own. Yes. Bring yeah. your equipment. Please do not bring Ouija boards or anything in that in genre. That, yeah. yeah. No spirit boards, for no. sure. No. Yeah. But yeah, come out, investigate, and then at the top of every hour, we'll do demos in certain different spots inside the inside of Benson Gris Mill. So we'll do dowsing rods and SC's method and any portal. Other, portal and any other things that yeah that the we obvious. can bring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you can join in on those demonstrations and or not, and go investigate yourself. Yeah, exactly. Either way. Yeah, just uh, it's also a costume contest, this event, uh, since, you know, we will be in the month of Halloween and it is Friday the 13th. So come and dressed. And why not? And why not? Exactly. Come dressed in a great costume, guys. Um, just make sure that, you know, that you bring tennis shoes, you know, proper footwear because, you know, the big mill, you got some steep stairs. Um, if you're wearing capes or masks or something. Uh, when you actually go to out to do your investigating, uh, do not wear capes or masks, anything that's a tripping hazard or um, hinders your eyesight. Yeah. And there are goat heads, a lot of goat heads out there. So wear yes. good shoes because you don't want to. Yeah. You don't want those in the bottom of your feet. That no, is going to. Yeah. Hurt. You don't want any, you know, heels on your boots and stuff like that. You want a good pair of walking shoes. Yep. For sure. Well, it's going to be an exciting time. It's going to be a lot of fun. Get your tickets on Eventbrite. Yes. And we also have a vendor there. Uh, Lavinia's Eden's going to be there. So bring your monies. Um, She sells all sorts of things. She does beautiful uh, wire wrapping on stones and crystals. Um, She just has an amazing amazing inventory. Yes, she does. Of of really cool stuff. And um, since it's Halloween, she'll have Halloween themed things as well. Absolutely. So bring your money and we'll serve hot cocoa and apple cider. And some light refreshments. Light refreshments. So everybody come out. Uh, Tickets are selling fast. So uh, make sure you come go to Eventbrite, get your ticket, and we'll see you there. Yeah. Now on to our wonderful, spooky, maybe spooky, ghost stories. A little bit of everything. Yes. So mine is a continuation of the book from the book Ghosts of Ogden, Brigham City, and Logan by Jennifer Jones. This is her accounts of when she's interviewing people and going to these places, these haunted places, and finds these stories. She said, I've never been told this story publicly before, but thought it would be a great one to include. It has happened to me shortly after I moved to Ogden. 
A few years ago, after going through a divorce, I decided to move to Ogden from a nearby town and needed to find a house to rent. Ogden is full of great old bungalows that have so much charm, and as someone who loves old houses, the creepier the better, I was so excited to find one of my own. I didn't take long, it didn't take long for me to find one that was close to the downtown area. My two children and I found a perfect house on Van Buren, a little more than a mile and a half from the Union Station. It was a small three-bedroom, one-bath brick bungalow with a fully furnished basement built in 1927. If you think about it, that's almost 100 years now. It's so close to 100 oh, years. That's crazy. When I looked at the house before I signed the lease, I didn't get the strange static electric feel that some haunted locations give me or have any reason to suspect this house would be haunted. However, looking back and when I when I was saying goodbye to the previous tenants, I remember the lady telling me that she thought I would be happy here as the house had a good spirit. We moved into the house at the end of September and settled into our new routine fairly quickly. The first few weeks were uneventful, and I never got the sense that the house might be haunted. Shortly before Halloween, I asked my ex-husband if he could come and stay with the kids as I wanted to go see the Rocky Horror Picture Show at Perry's Egyptian Theater with some friends. He agreed and stayed at the house until I returned around 11.30 p.m., and he didn't mention anything strange happening before he left that evening. A week or so later, my parents decided to come for a few days to visit. Because the house was so small, they slept on a pull-out sofa in the basement next to my daughter's room. The stairs leading to the basement were located off the kitchen, and the basement had one large open area and two rooms. My daughter's room was an average size, and the other room was very small. It was as big as some walk-in closets. I realized that it was where the homeowners would put would store coal, complete with an old coal chute. If I had to identify a creepy area in the house, that would be it. It was exact. It wasn't. I wasn't exactly sure why. It was just an odd room. My parents are not believers in the paranormal. I think they listen to my stories just to humor me. The third morning of their visit. I was up in the kitchen making breakfast and my dad commented on how late I was up the night before. He wanted to know whom I was talking to in the kitchen at almost midnight. I was puzzled. I hadn't stayed up late at all. I was asleep by 9.30 p.m. and I hadn't been talking on the phone, especially not in the kitchen in the middle of the night. I explained this to my dad and he looked a little confused and said, Well, that's really weird because it woke me up. I heard a woman in the kitchen and it sounded like she was having a phone conversation. I just assumed it was you. I figured he had dreamt it. I didn't put much thought into it until a couple of days later. I was in the bathroom getting ready and my mom came up to me and asked how my son Zach was doing. Again, I was puzzled. I said, he's fine, why? Like my dad had done a couple of days before, she had somewhat funny look on her face and said, uh, I thought so. And I asked her again and she said, well, I woke up last night because I thought I heard you talking. And I almost came upstairs, but as I was standing at the bottom of the stairs, I realized that it didn't quite sound like you, so I went back to bed. I said, you thought you heard me talking? She said, yes, it sounded like you were talking to Zach, so I thought maybe he wasn't feeling well. By now, my curiosity was definitely piqued. I had two of the most skeptical non-believers in ghosts tell me that they had heard a woman talking in my house in the middle of the night, and I knew it wasn't me. After they left, I had a conversation with my ex-husband about how both of my parents told me that they had heard a woman talking in the middle of the night. He got kind of quiet for a bit and then said, Huh, that's really strange. He then told me that the night had, the night he had come over to stay with the kids, he had fallen asleep on the sofa in the living room and was woken up by a woman talking. He said he lay there for a second trying to make out what she was saying, but he couldn't hear it well. And when he sat up to investigate, the talking stopped. He said the same thing as my parents did, that it sounded like it was coming from the kitchen. I decided to do some research on the house. It was built in November 1927, and I and purchased by Parley Smout. The elderly widow lived, widower lived in the home with his two young adult daughters, Anne Francis and Etta Smout. In July 1928, Parley Smout died in the home from old age. Following that year, Etta married John McDonald, and they lived in the house along with her sister, Anne, until their deaths. Anne died in the home in 1953, followed by John in 1957, and Etta in 1975. Wow. That is... Well, to have three people say the same thing in a short amount of time, I mean, that's not a coincidence to me. No. Here's the part that I found found kind of funny, though, is her mom's like, I went to come upstairs to see what was going on, but then I realized the voice really wasn't your voice. So So I I, went to bed. So I went back to bed. It's (laughs) like, wouldn't you... (laughs) I know. I thought that's strange, too. Like, there's a strange person in your house. You probably should go (laughs) investigate. Not just go back to bed. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Oh, my. So I've got some stories from uh, a website called, or a web post called 12 
scary ghost stories to make Halloween 2022 your creepiest yet. So go, the first one goes, I've never lived in a haunted house, but my mother did as a teen, writes reddit.com user patented space hook. Recounting a true event. Other houses on our street had strange things going on too. A few homes away from her, from her lived a family. One night, the daughter went to bed with a bad headache. The next day, she was dead. She passed away from an aneurysm. After her funeral, the family went away to get their minds off the tragedy. And their father asked my uncle, my mom's brother, to check on their pets. My mom and dad, who were dating at the time, went with him. My mother had heard there was a grand piano and she wanted to play it. My dad was studying to be a veterinarian. After entering the house, my uncle and my father headed to the basement to see the animals. And my mother went to the piano on, on the ground floor. She was playing it when she felt something brush her ankles. She thought a cat must have left the basement and walked past her. She kept playing, and then she felt it again. She looked under the piano and saw nothing. When she started again, she felt hands clasp her legs tightly. She dashed to the basement door, calling my uncle and father, and waited for them. Back outside, my uncle my uncle could tell my mom was rattled and asked what was wrong. She told him what had happened, and he turned white. He told her the daughter who had died used to play a game with her father. When he played the piano, she'd crawl underneath, grab his ankles, and push his feet up and down on the pedals. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> So cool. I love those things. I want something like that to happen to me. It that would be, be freaky, though. Like, at first, it would be terrifying. And then you'd be like, cool, do it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, we would. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We would. All right. So this next one that I have is really short, but it gets the point across. No. <laughs> it's called I'll Be Back. And it's done. <laughs> it's not that short. In 1989, I lived in a one-bedroom apartment that occupied the second floor of a two-story house. One night, shortly after moving in, I was awoke to the sound of someone walking down the hallway outside my bedroom. At first, I thought it was my cat. The hallway's old wooden floor creaked loudly, regardless of the weight of the walker. Then I saw my cat asleep next to me. I noticed that the footsteps came not from my living room, but from the other direction, which dead-ended at my bathroom. Before I could think more about it... A tall, slender man walked into the room. He paused in front of my bookcase and stared at me. He wore a blue windbreaker and a red baseball cap and looked to be in his early 60s. He just stared. I wonder whether this was only my imagination, but a quick glance at my cat revealed that he was staring at the visitor too. I turned my attention back to the man. Can I help you? I asked. The man shook his head. No, I was just looking around. I'll be back later to talk. Without another word, he walked out of the room and back down the hall. When the footsteps reached the bathroom, they just stopped. I pondered checking in the bathroom, but decided against it. The next day, I called a friend who had lived in the apartment before I had moved in. I asked whether anything strange occurred while she had lived, lived there. Blue windbreaker? Red baseball cap? She asked. I laughed. She said he came into the bedroom one night shortly after she moved in. He told her he would be back, but never returned. Yep. <laughs> I'm moving out. What is, here's like, like, why are you coming back, though? What's... Like, but, what, what's what's going on? But here's the part that's still, like, it's flabbergasting, right? Here's a man in your house. Yes. And he walks away and is like, I'll be back. And then do you get up and look to make sure he's gone? No, no. she decided against it and went back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what is with these people? Okay, mine is uh, called The Negative. In 1966, my four sons and I moved to a new house in Seattle. The house sat high on the side of the hill and afforded us a beautiful view of Puget Sound. It had three stories, bedrooms on the second floor and a living area on the main floor, and two bedrooms in the basement where three of my sons slept. One night, June 27th to be exact, I was asleep upstairs. My youngest son was asleep in the adjoining room. And at 12.20 a.m., I heard someone call me from the bottom of the stairs. I woke up, looked at the clock and listened to the footsteps on the stairs. When I heard the footsteps, I got out of bed immediately because I thought one of the boys was sick and needed help. I quietly went down the steps to the main floor and found the door at the bottom of the stairs open. I was surprised to find the door open because I always made sure it was closed when I went to bed. I called to the boys but got no answer, but I was still convinced I had heard one of my sons. I went through the kitchen to the basement, quietly asking the boys what was wrong. I found them all asleep. I couldn't figure this out. I went back upstairs and walked through the house to the living room. I even went on the front steps to see whether anyone was there. 
Nobody. I wasn't frightened but curious at what had awakened me. As I looked out the window, I had a strange sense of peacefulness. I remember thinking to myself that whoever it was who had called me was satisfied that I had heard the call. The next morning, I telephoned a close friend of mine who was a psychic and told her of my late night experience. She didn't say anything for a while, and then she started talking very slowly, asking me whether there was an attic in the house. I told her that there wasn't, but that there was a storage area upstairs under the eaves. She asked me whether it was finished, if it was finished off inside. I told her it wasn't. She told me to go up and look by a rafter that came down to the floor. There, I would find a picture. I told her I would call her back after I made my search. I went up to the storage area with a flashlight. I heard, I searched near the rafters as she had instructed, and I was surprised to find a negative stuck to the base of one of them. I called her right back and told her what I had found. She said that she had a strong feeling that there was a woman in the picture and that she was the one who had awakened me. There was indeed a woman in the picture with two small children standing by either of her side. By the woman's clothes and hairstyle, I knew that the picture had been taken in the 1940s. My friend suggested that I find out more about the previous owners. I had the negative printed and then took it to the next door neighbors who had lived there many years. The neighbors told me that the original owners of my house were an Italian couple with two children, a small boy and girl. The children grew up there and the daughter married a merchant seaman. When her husband was at sea, she and her two children would stay with her parents. Always she would stand at the window and watch the ships come and go, hoping to see her husband's ship returning. On June 27th, during the early part of World War II, she was looking out the window when she saw a man coming up the long steps to the house. When she answered the bell, the man handed her a telegram, which told her that her husband's ship had been torpedoed and that all hands on board had been lost. My ghost must have been the vigilant spirit of the young widow. Oh. <laughs> So sad. So sad. Sad. I wonder if the hill that she's that she's referring to is Queen Anne Hill. Mm. I wondered that too. Because that is one one of the oldest sections still standing in Seattle, and it overlooks Puget Sound. It's absolutely gorgeous up there. Yeah, it is. Within a couple homes that were built at the turn of the century that are up there. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Although beautiful homes, they're at the time that we were there, which was. Eight years ago, or no, 10 years ago, they were million dollar homes. Yeah. Ooh, then, can you imagine what they are now? Millions. But the crazy part is all of these gorgeous, beautiful, multi million dollar homes, right? And the draw and the roads were wide enough for one car. Yep. That's so, it. So if another car was coming down the same road, somebody <laughs> had to pull into a driveway and let the other car through. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, thanks. Nope. Couldn't do it. Okay. So mine is called The Phantom Patient. The ambulance company that I used to work for had a haunted ambulance, Rig 12, recounts reddit.com user Zerbo. A lot of EMTs had stories about it, but I never put much stock in paranormal stuff. That is, until I had my own experience with Rig 12. My partner and I, my partner and I were working in a rural community at 3 a.m., and it was pitch dark and completely quiet. We were both dosing. I was in the driver's seat, and she was in the passenger seat. I woke up to a muffled voice. But I thought my partner was talking. I told her I was trying to sleep and close my eyes. I distinctly heard a male voice say, Oh my God, I am, I am dying, followed by a few seconds of heavy breathing. My partner and I sat up straight and looked back into the patient compartment where it sounded like the voice had come from. Things were quiet for a couple of seconds. Then we heard the click of an oxygen bottle regulator and a hiss as if it was leaking. I turned on the lights and we ran out of the rig. I thought a transient might have climbed in, climbed in while we were asleep. So we opened the rear doors. No, no one was there. I checked the oxygen bottles. Neither was opened. We didn't sleep much after that. I wouldn't either. I'd be like up with my ghost equipment being like, do it again. <laughs> right? <laughs> we wouldn't be sleeping for a whole nother reason. Yeah, exactly. We'd be excited. We'd be excited. Like that's unique to have a haunted ambulance. Right? Uh, cool. But it doesn't surprise me. I mean, I'm thinking it might be residual, but still... Yeah. 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 You know, if someone's last moments of life were spent frightened, I'm dying. Can you imagine how much energy is in that? Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Because in a small space, yeah. nonetheless. Well, how many, how many, how much life and death fights and struggles and energy has been put into it? just well, exactly. one vehicle? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. A lot. Yeah. A lot. Okay. So this one's called Moving In. In July of 1978, we moved our family from Colorado to California. And since we had lived in the Bay Area before our move to Colorado, we were anticipating getting back home. We found a unique secluded home on nearly an acre of land. The house had been built in 1962, and the architect had used some natural redwood paneling and doors 
that had been taken from a summer cabin built on the property in the 1930s. The property had long stayed in the family of the original owner, and we were the first new owners. One day, soon after we moved in, I decided it was time to stock the kitchen. My husband and son were gone for the day, so my daughter and I did the shopping and returned to the house about 45 minutes later. After washing the lettuce, I turned on the garbage disposal. There was a terrible clunk clunk sound, and then a jam. I reached my hand down and felt a large metal object. It was an old rusted pocket knife. It broke the garbage disposal, of course. And when my husband and son returned that evening, I asked him whether they had ever seen the knife before. They answered no, and we all wondered where it could have come from. Before I left the shop, I had meticulously scoured the kitchen sink and had run the disposal. It had worked perfectly. The following Saturday, my husband's business partner from Los Angeles came to spend the weekend. In the early evening, We were sitting on the patio off the kitchen when old college friends dropped in. When the weather turned a little cool, we all went inside. About 10 minutes later, all five of us heard a tremendous shattering of glass in the kitchen area. We all jumped up and ran into the kitchen and patio, checking everywhere. Nothing could be found, not one shard of glass. After our friends left, my husband and I were determined to find the broken glass or to move out. (laughs) We finally gave up at 2 a.m. after searching every inch of every cupboard and drawer and scouring the patio for broken glass. We were exhausted, but we did stay. Our friends never visited us again (laughs) in the evenings. Before retiring, the business partner said, maybe I'm not your only house guest. Maybe you have a ghost. Our roof needed repair work, and we soon became familiar with the sounds of footsteps and hammering on the roof. We were also familiar with the noises of birds that went skittering across it, and the thumping of the occasional squirrel or raccoon. Shortly after the shattered glass experience, we were awakened early one Sunday morning to the sound of heavy footsteps and hammering on our roof. My first thought was, I'd better get dressed. What are they doing here on a Sunday? My husband got up and looked out our windows, expecting to see a truck in our driveway. There was no truck and no crew, and the noises quickly stopped. Once again, we seriously thought of getting rid of this house and its resident ghost. But I had made arrangements to have new carpeting installed in just a few days, and we are expecting company from Colorado. The focal point of our living room is a large, very heavily antique pewter chandelier that was in the house when we bought it. Right after the carpet installers left, the chandelier started swaying in the circular motion. And believe me, nothing less than a good-sized earthquake could move that chandelier. By this time, I was starting to become accustomed to the idea that we had a ghost. I stood back from the swaying chandelier and said in a loud voice, I'm glad you like the new carpets. I hope you like the skylight we're going to put in the kitchen. The chandelier stopped swaying just as suddenly as it had started. Everything was quiet and normal after that. No more ghosts or occurrences until Christmas Eve, the first in our new home. It was close to 9 p.m. Our family gathered around the tree and fireplace, listening to Christmas carols, each of us trying to decide which gift we would choose to open this night. We weren't expecting company, and it was long a long walk up our private drive to the front door. We all heard the footsteps approaching our front door, and our two dogs went crazy barking and jumping at the door. We were surprised that someone would come unannounced on Christmas Eve. We waited for the doorbell to ring. It didn't. We got the dogs under control and then opened the door, fully expecting someone to be standing there. There wasn't anyone visible, and my husband's son went way down the road looking for whoever it was who had come to our door. I just had a smile, and in a loud voice I said, Thanks for stopping by, and Merry Christmas to you too. Our Christmas tree lights dimmed, and then came on very bright. Maybe it was just a power surge, but most most probably it wasn't. After the first of the year, and in subsequent years, a few unexplained things have happened. Sprinklers have mysteriously turned on. Thermostats have somehow turned themselves all the way up. But I truly believe that our ghost is now happy and satisfied with the new family that occupies his old haunts. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that is cool. It just wanted to be acknowledged. Yep. Yep. I think that's all I wanted. Mm-hmm. Look, I'm, I'm not forgotten. They know I'm here. And we're all good. And we're all good. I mean, if you think about it, if you're a ghost, you probably don't have a lot of people acknowledge you. No. You know? And so when finally somebody does, it's like, okay, I'm going to keep it up. Yeah. Because I want attention. Well, and I, I, I think it, it, it goes without kind of saying that living or not, I don't think anybody likes to be forgotten. Mm-mm. No. We all like to be remembered. Or discarded. So something to remember. Why are you staring at me when you say that? No particular reason. (laughs) I'm just saying in general, nobody likes to be forgotten or disregarded. No, absolutely. And that's something we should all keep in mind. In the mist of dark, overhanging trees stood my family's old house. Strange things happened while I was living there. And these experiences shaped my beliefs about existence of ghosts. It was on the cold wintry night that I first encountered the unwanted visitor in our house. 
I remembered laying in my mother's bed because it was warmer in her room, and both my parents and sister were out for the evening. I was alone with just my thoughts to keep me company. I had nearly fallen asleep when I heard the sound of footsteps in the hall. I immediately saw a figure of a tall, dark man, luminous in appearance, in the doorway. His clothes were black, and he wore a brimmed hat on his head. I could vaguely make out a cape, which hung loosely around his shoulders. Numbed with fear, I stared at the advancing figure. Oh, please don't come any closer, I thought to myself. My attention was drawn hypnotically to his eyes, which had the somber look of a man who delighted in evil destruction. I hastily looked for a weapon to use against him. I had an old pair of shoes that was nearby and that would serve as my purpose. I reached over and grabbed them and flung them right at him. He vanished into thin air. Sanity, I reestablished myself in my mind. I felt safe again until the next time he appeared. Sometime later, my sister began complaining of disturbing nightmares. One night, I agreed to keep her company at bedtime. We retired late that evening, and I lay down on the extra bed in her room. I was listening to the train that passed by at the same time each night. I sat up to see whether I could catch a glimpse of it as it roared by. Instead, I saw him again, this time sitting in a chair by the window, in the, by the bedroom window. His hand rested underneath his chin as if he were in deep thought. His face turned away from me. I wondered to myself whether he was also waiting for the train to pass by. Would he be able to hear it? I was curious about what he was thinking, but I was careful not to disturb him. But then, with a perfectly involuntary, involuntary movement, I leaned toward him. My curiosity had engulfed my better sense of judgment. As I moved, he suddenly jerked his head around toward me, and for just a moment, I looked into a face that looked just like that of a corpse. Impulsively, I turned away in disgust. When I looked back, he was gone. The third encounter was of a more violent nature. It was during the summer, and we all liked to keep our windows open to keep cool breezes that came up in the night. My parents and I were awakened from the sleep that night by blood-curling screams. We all rose quickly from our beds and ran down the hallway to where the screams were coming from, my sister's room. We opened her bedroom door and found her clutching her throat. After we calmed her, she began to tell us what had happened. A tall man, she said with dark eyes and old-fashioned clothes, was trying to strangle me. Her screams, she felt, had scared him away. She had also been very level-headed with not much of an imagination. Now terror filled her eyes, and her description of the assailant was enough for me to realize that she was describing the man I had seen. Perhaps thinking that we had been tormented enough, I set out to discover why all this was happening. After lengthy research into our old newspaper articles and public records, I found the answer. Old real estate records showed that the house had been constructed in the late 1800s and that people had rented rooms here by the week or month. Most didn't stay very long. The house was sold to my parents in the early 1940s and later made it into a one-family home. After several late evenings at, at the library, I also came across an old newspaper article that revealed a significant fact. Printed in a column relating local news was the story of a man who had committed suicide in his room in the boarding house. It didn't give much detail, only that only his name and address. It didn't surprise me to see that the address was the same as that of our house. I discontinued research after that. I guess I just don't want to know any more about it. I moved out of my parents' home shortly thereafter. I know he's still there. Crazy. Creepy. Ooh, little spooky. But you know, she fought back. Like, she threw a shoe at it. I know. And honestly, that itself is actually quite impressive. Because most of the time people just freeze and they like don't move or when it's like coming through a doorway and there's like no escape. The only way to escape is if you go through them. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I think honestly that that was impressive. But I mean, I've seen a spirit, an entity like that in a hotel room. Almost, really? almost just like that. Crazy. But this man had to have been like eight, nine feet tall that I saw. Jeez. Probably eight feet. But it was, he was really broad, like really wide. But yeah, he looked just like that. Intimidating. Super mm -hmm. scary. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit. Okay, we're going to go a little bit lighter. <laughs> this one's called The Impish Ghost. My neighbor D Diane and I had a playful poltergeist for years and we called it Billy. So begins Reddit.com user Abby's alibi in their real life ghost story. I'd come home and find something put in a weird place. Milk in a cupboard, toilet paper in the fridge, laundry laundry detergent in the bathtub. Diane once asked, called to ask if Billy had been around because she couldn't find a gallon of milk. We finally found it outside on her back steps and sugar. Darn sugar. Every morning, my sugar bowl was empty. When I had had enough, I would point to Diane's home and yell, go see Diane. Within five minutes, I'd get a call from her. Thanks a lot, she'd say. 
he'd <laughs> gone and pulled some shenanigans at her place. This occurred for the entire two years we lived there. No one believed us, not even our husbands. My mother thought someone was stealing from us when we were sleeping or out of the house. My sister believed something was going on, but didn't know what. I still can't just explain any of it. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. If Little I ever pranks. have a ghost, I'm going to tell him to come over here and bug you. Cool. And then I'll send him back to you <laughs> with a battle plan. <laughs> <laughs> it's on. I mean, honestly, for ghost hunters, that would be really fun. <laughs> that would be so fun. <laughs> uh, I haven't slept in a week. Why? Because we've been sending the ghost back and forth playing <laughs> pranks on each other. <laughs> That's exactly what it would be. You can find the milk and <laughs> sit on the Sugar. Cat. Sugar. <laughs> Sugar, Sugar on top of the milk, on top of the cat tree, on top of the house. Right? <laughs> It'd be fun. <laughs> okay. This one is called Two Small White Coffins. How cheery. So pleasant. <laughs> My grandmother always told this story as absolute fact. She had no doubt that she had somehow received messages three times from the hereafter. My grandparents, Tom and Goldie Hill, were married in 1910 in Warsaw, Kentucky, and eventually they had six children. In early 1922, mom had a very disturbing dream in which someone had pushed two small white coffins up onto the, our back porch. In October, their 15-month-old daughter, Martha Thomas, died of meningitis. Even though my grandfather was steadily employed, times were hard, and they were poor as jobs turkey. Must have been a saying back in those days. No kidding. The local undertaker, who was a friend of the family, knew my grandparents couldn't afford much and kindly donated a tiny white casket for the little girl's funeral. A few minutes later, my grandma again dreamt of two little white coffins. A few minutes later? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that poor woman. <laughs> a few months later, my grandmother again dreamt of two little white coffins. In August of 1923, their four-year-old daughter... Rena died of diphtheria. Once again, the undertaker generously gave them a small white casket. My grandfather died in 1957, and a son, Sam, passed on a year later. Shortly after, after Uncle Sam's death, Mom awakened one night and felt her husband standing next to her bed. It's all right, Goldie, he told her. Now I have three of the children with me, and you have three of them with you. Then Big Daddy departed, never to be heard from again. Every time Mom got to the part about my grandfather's ghostly visit, I'd asked her if she's ever been afraid. She'd always say, why? No siree, it was only Tom. Why should I be afraid of him? <laughs> <That's cute. laughs> it's like a premonition. Dream. Yeah, it uh -huh. kind of is. I mean, yeah. I think sometimes we can get, um, like when we had talked about in our um, episode of when people pass away mm -hmm. and they're visited and kind of warned or you know yes. things like that i think that this could be like that where they get that yeah i like what you said like a premonition but get that warning yeah 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 to kind of get that in their minds and help them sad though yeah it is sad especially because you know the white coffins are children and that's always the that's always the tough part right yeah mm -hmm. i would be scared be like okay who's next I like would that too. would be terrifying well especially after you have the dream once and then a child, you lose a child, but then you have it again a few months later. Yeah. And knowing it already happened once and you're having the dream again, you're thinking, uh oh, uh -oh. who's next? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Preparing yourself. Yeah. That would be very, very tough. Okay. This one is called A Distinct Odor of Blood. You? Yeah. Blood has a really nasty smell. That's like iron. Yeah. yeah. I'm a struggling actor, and in the winter of 1981, I had just moved back to Dallas from New York City. I'd been cast in a theatrical production of Marcia's Norman's prize-winning play, Getting Out. As is usual for many actors, I was low on funds and needed an apartment close to the theater at a price that I could afford. So I answered an ad for one located just around the corner. When the landlady showed it to me, the first thing I noticed was that the distinct odor of blood was as I was walking over the threshold. She remained in the hall. Do you mind if I glance around a bit? I asked her, wondering why she was just standing there. Of course, take all the time that you need she said before making a beeline for her office. It was a simple two-room flat heated by a gas wall heater in the living room. I stepped over to test it and at about two feet away from it, I again noticed the odor of blood. I hadn't really paid attention to it before because it had passed so quickly, but, but this time I was standing still and the sensation was very real. I looked, but there was no stains on the apparent new carpet. The smell disappeared when I moved on. In all other respects, the, pla the place was just what I wanted. So I took it. My first night there was distressing. I couldn't fall asleep. Something was keeping me awake, and after much tossing and turning, I decided to put my bed in another position in the room. I almost drifted off, and then I was awakened with a start. 
I tried another position, but still sleep eluded me. Four times I moved from the bed, and four times I was suddenly awakened with no apparent reason. All the time this was going on, I kept glancing around the room to see whether there was something about the place I was missing. I could see nothing out of the ordinary. Because the temperatures in Dallas that winter were unusually cold, I finally decided to move into the living room where it was warmer. As I passed the heater, I picked up the odor of blood again. What had happened here? A bloody murder? And why were there only two places, the entrance and near the heater, where I could smell the blood? Thinking back on her actions, I concluded that the, my landlady knew something, but she wasn't about to tell a new renter that this apartment might be haunted. Could it be? No, there was no such thing as ghosts, and with that I fell asleep. A few weeks later, after a cast party, I was settled in for a good sleep. The heater was on low, and I could hear a brisk wind outside, and there was a... T- a talk of snow before dawn. I remember drifting off thinking about the snow, and then suddenly I was wide awake. I was facing the wall, but I knew I was not alone. Something, someone, was behind me, there in the room. Every hair on my body stood on end. I was staring at the blank wall, listening for any movement, the rustle of feet on carpet, the brush of cloth against the door frame, the, the inhalation of air whistling through, the nos- through nostrils anything that would give me the slightest clue as to who was there watching me. After what seemed like several minutes, but in reality was maybe only one, I slowly began to turn over. I didn't want to alert my visitor. I didn't want to appear threatening in any way. Somehow I knew instinctively that whoever or whatever was there was not a threat to me. I turned my head to the side so I could see the whole room. And there it was. A ghost. I think it was a she-ghost. A child. She was about three feet tall and was more like an oblong shape of smoke than a, than a formed body but somehow it seemed like a body. And she was looking right at me. She had no head, but the top of the form, although eyeless, was very obviously aware of me and was looking in my direction. Naturally, I thought this was a trick of my sleepy eyes. I had had nothing to drink and I don't smoke, so it wasn't a cigarette I had left burning. I fixed my eyes on her and moved my head from side to side to see whether it was there or what they call floaters in my eyes. Then I focused my eyes about three feet to her right and with my peripheral vision, could still see that she was there, about two feet in front of the heater. I turned on my side toward her and looked, and she looked back. Understand, these looks were sensations, but they were just as real as if someone human and alive had been in the room with me. She didn't move around. I could see through her as if I were looking through a cloudy glass. Believe it or not, without either of us uttering a sound, there was communication between us. Not sentences, but feelings, emotions. She was lonely, and she was curious about me. She was a little afraid, and I let her know, by thinking and exact and actually feeling it, that there was nothing to be afraid of, that everything was all right. I then rolled back over to my side and started to go to sleep again, like a parent reassuring a child with his voice in the night and going back to sleep. A few minutes later, I was wide awake again, and I was still facing the wall, but now I was also facing my visitor. She had moved. She was standing about a foot in front of me, looking down at me. I looked up at her and wondered why she was still here. Immediately, I got my answer. A feeling of sincerity came over me, and she had come to thank me to say goodbye. That night, I slept like a baby. The next morning, I asked my landlady about the apartment, and I told her that I had trouble sleeping the first night and asked whether anyone had died in that place. She gave me a look of horror, wondering how I knew to ask that and answered only that an old woman had had a heart attack in the bedroom shortly before I moved in. I wondered whether she had seen my little friend and been frightened to death. Then I asked her about the smell of blood, as she dismissed me quickly with the statement that she didn't know what I was talking about and refused to discuss it any further. When I went back to my place, I couldn't help noticing how fresh and clean the place smelled. All over. And I smiled to myself. (laughs) (laughs) That reminds me of of a story I heard. I was... Um, oh my gosh, I was watching, it was one of those talk shows back in the 80s. And I don't know which one it was, to be honest. But this lady was talking about apartments she was living in. And it was, it was on ghost stories. And she had a kind of a similar experience. But it was a lady that kept showing up in her apartment. And she was like missing part of it. Like she had been gutted. Ugh. And she would see it and smell it. Ugh. Like how she died? That She looked as, as if she was dead. So like... yeah. Just like the whole Ghostbusters, like when the ghosts came yeah. out and they looked like they as they were as they died. Yeah. That's what was she was seeing constantly. And she's like, Nope. Uh uh-uh. uh. I mean, for me, it's a whole nother level of haunting. Yeah. So my next story is from Ten Real Life Scary Stories for Halloween twenty twenty two. Fresh out of nursing school. I got my first real job in a fairly large hospital in a department that I honestly never thought I would ever work in. It was a six-bed cardiac ICU with rooms that overlooked the city 
Capitol building. It was a very nice unit, and I started out working 12-hour night shifts. Yikes. Yeah, no thanks. The hospital I, had, I worked at had four other ICUs that were always full, so my unit always ended up being code bed, meaning if someone was arrested or went downhill fast, somewhere around the hospital, they came to us. I had been working there for a year, and I was no stranger to death. Each patient, each patient of mine who had died on my shift was usually already on their way out. Their families were by their side. The DNR order was signed. The funeral home was already picked, picked out. It was rarely ever a surprise. In fact, the only time I was ever needed to do CPR on my shift it wasn't even in my department. So I went on a nice long two-week vacation, got engaged, and had a beautiful tan. On my first night back, I received a report from the from the day charge nurse. She said she was off for a few days and suggested to remind the next day charge nurse that the priest was coming in in the morning to bless room four. I thought she was kidding at first, but she was serious. Apparently, while I was on vacation, every patient who was admitted to that room had died. But this came as no shock to me. People died often in our in our department. And it being a very religious institution, having a chaplain for almost every department, I just shook it off. Then she said that room four was empty and that it would serve as a code bed for the night. Around 2 a.m., I got a call saying that they have someone to fill our open bed. The ICU downstairs was now going to be a code bed. So we're getting our, holy cow, hard... <laughs> Around 2 a.m., I got a call saying that they have someone to fill our open bed. The ICU downstairs was now going to be code bed, so we were getting your run-of-the-mill chest pain. I took a look in the morning, kind of patient, nothing to get excited about. We get the patient admitted and all settled in room four. He was a gentleman about 50 or so years old, very pleasant. His wife was with him, and she looked dead on her feet. I got her some warm blankets and took her to our waiting room that had caught so she could get some rest. Around 3.30, I was watching monitors and the cameras in each room. All the patients were fast asleep. The cameras all cycled through about three seconds each on one small TV we had at our desk. Room one was fine. Room two was fine. Room three was fine. Room four, there was someone in there. It cycled too quickly for me to get a good look. The doors to the unit were locked. Maybe the other nurse l let his wife back in. I walked down the hall and glanced inside. There was nobody. I shrugged it off. It was late. I was tired. I was probably just seeing things. I went back to the desk and continued watching the screen. Room one, Room two, room three, room four. I was not imagining anything. There was someone in room four. The person was standing in the corner by the window, their figure completely draped in the shadow. I could not move my body. It cycled through again. This time, it was closer to the patient's bed. By maybe two or three feet, the hair stood straight on my neck. The next time it cycled through, it was even closer. It stood in the light coming from the hallway, but despite the light, it was still shrouded in darkness. It cycled through again and it was right next to the bed. My heart started pounding. I could barely squeak to the nurse on the other side of the desk. As soon as my, my words formed and I was able to make some kind of noise to get their attention, the alarm on the monitor went off, signaling that the patient had cardiac arrested. The overhead system came on. A card is needed in CCU room four. The people poured into the department, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, respiratory therapists. They all rushed into the room, but I couldn't move. It cycled through the room again, Room four came up, and this time the lights were on, and there were 10 to 15 people surrounding the bed, doing CPR and slamming meds into his IV. Someone went to get his wife from the waiting room, but there it was, in the opposite corner again, a dark figure watching the scene play out, just standing there. The man died of a heart attack. Room four was blessed that morning, right on schedule. I had to put in my two weeks' notice. Uh, I don't know if I would have given him two weeks. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That's I got chills from that one. Well, that like... With that, she cycled through that thing like four or five times before she said anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think after the second one for me, I've been like, okay, hold on. I got to go check this room. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come back. Come look at this with me. I swear there's somebody in here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, I'm going to go look in this room and you're going to look at the monitor at the same time. And we're going to see if we see <laughs> at the same thing. Well, how crazy to think that. Crazy. The start of her shift, the day, the day charge said, you know, we're, we we we're have a we have a priest coming for room 4 to bless it. To bless the room mm -hmm. and the room's empty. Yeah. Like there's no patient in the room yet. It's like what did you know? Like did yeah. you see the dude too and you just know when you <laughs> see black dude someone's dying in that room? <laughs> that that room probably needs to be blessed. <laughs> Makes me think of asylum. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Okay, so this next one is called Goodnight Kisses. It's going to be sweet or terrifying. I, I don't know what you I want. Don't know. I don't know if I want those goodnight kisses. <laughs> We're going to find out. It was a dark and stormy night. Well, not actually, but I've always wanted to start a story that way. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Good night, we all said with various smiles and whispers as Papa, my grandfather, turned the lights out. 
We were all in a large rectangular room built years before any of us were even born. There were cots and beds lined up military style down two walls. The only doorway led into the kitchen. It was the Christmas season of 1956 and my sister and I, along with our parents, had traveled from Phoenix to Hayward, California to visit my grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins. In a few days, we would be opening presents, and eat a magnificent Italian Christmas dinner. We were all very excited and trying to fall asleep with neither a quiet nor a calm exercise. (laughs) One by one, we all felt drowsiness overcome, overcome us. The darkness in the room painted everything in barely discernible but soft shapes and shades of gray. We all felt safe. We were surrounded by family and generations of love. As we all began to fall asleep, someone could be heard entering the room. Drowsy and comfortable, I didn't even open my eyes, but could hear breathing and the rustle of clothing as someone bent over my cousin, Jonathan, whose cot was next to the doorway. I heard what sounded like a murmur and a kiss and then felt the presence bend over me as well. There was cautious movement and breathing above me. Even with my eyes closed, I knew that someone was just above my face looking at me as parents do when they last have an opportunity to watch us slowly and watch us in slow motion. I smelled tobacco just as on my father's breath and assumed it was him. I felt a light kiss and then snuggled into my pillows. He moved around my bed and over to my sister, who was deeper into the room, laying in the next bed. Again, I sensed him, this time bending over my sister. She timidly questioned, Daddy? There was no answer, though my sister could obviously sense his presence. She called out more loudly, Daddy? Still no answer. He didn't move, nor did he answer. Something in my sister's voice awakened my cousins, who began to ask who was there. Jonathan sat up and turned on the light. No one was there. No one stood next to my sister. No one could have left the room. There was only one way out, past Jonathan and me, and none of us had sensed or seen anyone leaving. Instantly, the room went from warmth to terror. Several of the children became hysterical. My sister wailed the loudest. Parents came scrambling downstairs, fearing the worst. We were calmed and hugged and kissed and held until we all stopped shouting or crying. We were sure that it must have been our imagination. A light was left on in the kitchen to help us feel safer. Hours later, we finally accepted our parents' words and fell asleep. As children, we never wondered why our parents did not accuse us of telling stories or of trying to scare each other. Years later, my mother told me that when she was a girl in this house, house, members of the family would often see the outline of a man in the kitchen doorway. It was always at night, and he would just stand there. And if one walked toward him, he would either fade away or turn around and walk into the same room where we had been sleeping. Perhaps his grave was under the room, my mother suggested. Or perhaps he had died while building the home. No one knew. And for all we know, he could still be there today. I do know, however, that we were not threatened that night. We were safe. We were loved by a spirit that in the calm that darkness offers simply sought to comfort us and wish us sweet dreams. That's sweet and terrifying. That'd be terrifying as a kid. I mean, mean, let's be real. I mean, yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, like like you can obey that you can only say that that's sweet when you're an adult. Right. Looking back at it. But as a kid, that would be in the moment. In the moment that'd be terrifying. Especially like for the little girl who's like, you know, smells the tobacco daddy. No answer. Daddy, no answer. They all wake up. Nobody's there. <laughs> <laughs> Who is just kissing us? <laughs> yeah, Ugh. I mean, that's a little creepy in a way. Yeah. So this one's called Ghost Tent. Ooh, right up our alley. Woo-hoo! Perfect. I've always been interested in the parapsychology and the supernatural, and I've taken some classes relating to these subjects. When I heard about a haunted house for sale several miles down the road, I was fascinated. The house was listed with a realtor, and because I lived in the area, I thought I had to justify why I wanted to look at it. I finally concocted a story about my mother hoping to move near me and said that we were looking for a small house to purchase for her. I had made an appointment to go see the house and dragged my husband along too. It was a hot summer night in August without a breath of wind. The realtor was there when we arrived. When she unlocked the door, there was such a cold blast of air that I couldn't believe it. The house had been vacant for some time, and I couldn't understand why. On the walls of one of the bedrooms were plastered hundreds of shards of glass, all shapes and sizes. It looked as if it had come from a broken mirror. Covering the walls of the other rooms were cutouts of the moon, the sun, the stars, and different formations. In all the rooms, even in the bedrooms, there were beautiful chandeliers made of crystal. Although they were dusty and dirty, they were obviously beautiful. I asked the realtor about the bizarre decorations, and she said, Rumor had it that gypsies had lived there, and that one had been murdered there. 
When we said our goodbyes and, after the realtor left, returned to the house. I was, it was almost dusk at the time, and although we could not get into the house, we walked into the backyard. There was a small fountain there, with benches on either side, and several trees and bushes hanging in it, and several trees and bushes overhanging it. I sat down on the bench while my husband walked around. Suddenly, I felt a cold blast of air pass over me. I started to talk, as though there was someone there, saying, I would like to help you if you let me. Is there anything I can do? I talked quietly for several minutes and was very intent on what I was doing. Suddenly, I heard my husband whisper, Look at that! When I raised my eyes, I saw a small whirlwind kicking up the dirt along one of the trees. Bear in mind that up until that moment, there had been no breeze at all. I kept talking, saying things like, I care about you. How can I help? Are you lost? You can leave if you want to, but you are safe here. Slowly, the whirlwind moved up into the air and around my head several times. I could feel the strong breeze it created. My hair was blowing out from my head as though I were in the middle of a a windstorm when it moved away into a tree and stopped. Not a leaf rustled or moved anywhere. My heart was pounding and my husband was ready to drag me out of there. I sat very still and then got up and walked around the area for a few more minutes. I was, it was getting dark quickly by then. I began to be uneasy, but I wanted to try one more time. So I sat down again and began to say the same things as before. I also said, It's okay if you want to go now. There is no reason for you to stay. You can be happy. As I was talking, the whirlwind suddenly came out from another tree and stopped right over my head. It hovered there for a moment and then began to descend. I sat very still. Suddenly, I experienced what felt like a million little feathers softly touching my face. It was almost like a gentle gentle little kisses. Just as quickly as it began, it stopped and the whirlwind moved straight up from my head and disappeared. It was thought it was as though it had never been there. Needless to say, we hastily left the yard. When we got home, my husband said, if I hadn't been there and seen that, I would never have believed it. Soon after, the for sale sign was taken down and a family moved in. I guess the spirit found its way back. I hope I helped. Oh, that's sweet, though. That'd be crazy, too. It would be. Your hair blown every (laughs) which way. And your husband just watching it like, what the heck is happening? (laughs) This is supposed to be in a creepy movie. And what do you think your husband would say? Yeah, it's, it's just, just the, the wind. wind. <laughs> <laughs> that was in unison. <laughs> we know him very well. <laughs> so my last story is from 11 real life horror stories. True horror stories reported in the news. Ooh, Ooh cool. So this, this came from KPRC2 Houston News. And it's entitled The Haunted Doll. Oh, who doesn't like a good haunted doll? Right? Yeah. These are like, you think of haunted dolls like those old Victorian, creepy, like weird dolls? Oh, I've held a haunted doll that was in a box and it thumped in the box. Was that Popo the Clown? Popo the Clown. The little clown doll. From uh, the Jamie Lynn Darling had in a box. Yeah. 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 It was like rolling around in the box. Yeah. And then Alan held it and it stopped. <laughs> of course. It's like he's not going to believe even if I do it. So why bother? <laughs> 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 even if I were to pop out of the lid. <laughs> Alan! And yell out. <laughs> <laughs> Hello! Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that's a pretty cool trick you got going there. <laughs> Animated doll. All right. When you think of haunted dolls, it's likely the creepy, old, Victorian-looking porcelain kind that springs to mind. None of which you'd probably have laying around. Still, don't get too comfortable around any kids' toys too soon, though. A Disney's Frozen Elsa doll that was gifted for Christmas in 2013. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) In the Houston area, made headlines earlier this year when it seemingly became haunted. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> no, exactly. So the doll recited phrases from the movie Frozen and sang Let It Go. Oh, when a, shut up. When a button on its necklace was pressed. Okay, fair. Okay. For two years, it did that in English. Mother Emily uh, Madonia said. In 2015, it started doing it alternating between Spanish and English. Oh, There that's wasn't weird. a button that changed, that the changed it. It was just random so it wasn't like buzz lightyear where he has the button where it sets it to a spaniel no <laughs> it just did it oh geez the family has owned the doll for more than six years and never changed its batteries wow uh, whoa those are pretty good batteries right 
The mother says the doll would randomly begin to speak and sing even if it was switched off. Let it go. <laughs> let it go. Can you imagine like burn it? You're like you're like sleeping in bed at night and it's like let it go. You're like <laughs> Yep. So the family decided to throw the creepy doll out in December of 2019. Weeks later, they found it inside a bench in their living room. Oh no, 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 no. The kids insisted they didn't put it in there. And I believe them because they wouldn't have dug through the garbage outside, <laughs> Modonia told C- CPR C2 News. At that point, Elsa ceased to sing the English rendition of Let It Go altogether, speaking only Spanish when pressed. The family then double-bagged the bizarre doll and placed it at the bottom of their garbage, which was taken out on garbage day. They went on a trip shortly after, but when they returned, Elsa too had come back. Oh, no. And was waiting in their backyard of their home. Oh, no. <laughs> This time, the family mailed Elsa to a family friend in Minnesota <laughs> who taped the haunted doll to the front bumper of his truck. <laughs> this just gets better. It doesn't seem to have made its way back to Houston yet, as per Madonia's la- latest February Facebook update on the creepy doll. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that is the best story of a haunted doll I've That's ever good. heard. <laughs> Strapped it to the truck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but imagine you double bag it. It goes into the truck the next day, yep. you go on vacation, and it's sitting on your back deck. No thanks. Nope. Devil's in that doll. Yeah. <laughs> right? Reminds me of the Boppet. Oh, yeah. The Boppet. Oh, yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, what? <laughs> yeah, you missed that one. That yep. was pretty good. No, I will not turn off. I'm not going to turn off. <laughs> That's what it said. I was like, oh, well, really? <laughs> yeah, that was good. No, that was a good one to end it on. All right. That was a great one. Uh, yeah. I gotta top that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. So, as per our recent episodes, we've got cookie of the episode. Yes. And honestly, this one was an absolute winner. It was what, super tasty, guys. What was it, Jamie? It was a homemade version of the Little Debbie oatmeal cream pie, but so much better. Oh yeah! Once you have it, I think homemade. I don't know how you could go buy a box of Little Debbies again unless you are desperate and lazy and don't want to make this, which I can understand that too. But these, these surpass those. Well, for me, it's like, those are nasty cookies anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She don't like the little Debbie oatmeal cream pies. uh -uh. I don't like oatmeal in my cookies, but this is delicious. Yeah. So that's saying something if she likes them. Right. (laughs) If I like it, then you'll like it. Yeah. I think the, the, the neatest part is like, on the li- on the little Debbie ones, it's a super sweet. Like the whole thing is just super sweet. Well, of course. But it doesn't like the cr- the cream in the middle doesn't have a lot of flavor. It's just like sugar. Yeah, well, it's oh. a vanilla flavor. Right, but on this one, it's a vanilla flavor. Like you can really taste the vanilla, yeah. which it's which makes it really good. Yeah. So we'll post the recipe uh, link to this as well, which is also on Pinterest. But. Um, if you make these cookies, I highly recommend that you make your own brown sugar. Super it, easy. Super easy to do. Um, and yeah, make your own brown sugar when you make these because this is what's going to give them that deep, rich flavor and the softness and the chewiness, just like a little Debbie one. Yeah. And cut the the sugar in half for the filling. Yeah. I mean, everybody's different, but I would start off with... Um, just a little powder sugar and then just keep adding until you get the thickness for your cream filling that you desire and then stop there. Don't go any further. That's what I did. No, it's a good, it's mm-hmm. a good. Yeah. And then it's like a tablespoon to a tablespoon and a half dollop in the middle, put the top cookie on half and squish it down just a little bit and it's done. Which was honestly the perfect amount of filling too. I think so. Yeah. So yeah. Cookie of the week. Or cookie of the week. I said week. Uh, cookie of the episode. Cookie, yes. <laughs> Either way. Just want to say thank you to everybody for coming, hanging out, and listening uh, to us. We really appreciate all of you out there listening uh, and tuning in. And if you uh, if you like our episodes, please go ahead and rate us and leave a review on, on whatever uh, podcast app you're listening to us on. Yeah, or if you have a experience or a story to share, please do. We love hearing from you guys. Absolutely. And if you want us to read it on air, we'll we'll read it on air. Absolutely. And as always, stay ghosty, my peeps.
I had two of the most skeptical. Skeptical. <laughs> I'm so skeptical. <laughs> I'm so skeptical. 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 Okay. So in 1989, I lived in a one bedroom apartment that occupied the second floor of a 20, sorry, 20 story house. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. It's called a skyscraper, dear. <laughs> They own the whole New York skyscraper. That's awesome. In the suburbs. Yeah. <laughs> in 1966, my four sons and I moved to a new house in Seattle. The house sat high on, on the side of the hill and afforded us a beautiful view of Puget Sound. It had three stories. <laughs> Hold on. Sorry. Wait, 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 wait. Puget. Puget. It's Puget. Puget Sound. Pug it. P- Puget. <laughs> you said Puget. Puget. It's Puget. <laughs> Puget. Okay, we're starting Puget. Over. Puget. Puget. Puget nugget. Okay. It's, it's, it's pronounced. It's pronounced. Puget. No. <laughs> the bouquet. It's, it's bouquet. So what is it again? Puget. Puget. Puget yep. sound. Puget. 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 Okay. Starting all over. Thank you for listening to the Paranormal Peeps podcast. You can find us on social media at Twitter at CPR Paranormal, on Facebook at Paranormal Peeps Podcast and Cold Spot Paranormal Research. And you can find us on Instagram at Cold Spot underscore Paranormal underscore Research.